Yes, you are my starship. Come take me out tonight. And when that mother was said, and don't you come too soon, I know what the fuck that meant then. Oh, but I didn't know. done so please remember to like share and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube and if you are not already a part of our book club please remember to hit the patreon link below and for a small monthly fee you can be privy to all the shenanigans before YouTube gets it if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's talk about You Know How to Love Me. Hey, hey, you know how to make it right. Phyllis Hyman. Part of the reason why I'm doing this Phyllis Hyman uh, unsung recap is because the Bellas and the um, um, Love Bugs have told me that they want Phyllis Hyman's book to be put on the list. So once we get finished with the uh, Coldest Winter Ever, we're going to move into Phyllis Hyman, okay? Because y'all tell me what to do. I don't have no say-so in this goddamn book club. It's just hilarious. Phyllis me. Hyman grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood on the south side of Pittsburgh. Her father was a barber and her mother was a homemaker. The two moved from Pittsburgh to Philly shortly after her birth in 1949. There were seven kids and Phyllis was the oldest. God bless the first girl. Oh my God, oh my God. I'm not gonna make this about me, but I'm telling you, the oldest daughter, you know how it is. Unless you smoke and crack, you damn near the mother around there. Like, damn, I ain't had these little mothers. Why, Jesus, why? According to the unsung, all of them had talent, all right? But Phyllis was the standout star. By the time she got to junior high school, the family realized that Phyllis could low okay in school she joined the choir and her vocals were nurtured by her music teacher he offered her voice lessons and she went for years she obtained a scholarship for college but she left after one year to proceed pursue her singer career inspired by nancy wilson and a black nationalist she created the sound of ebony girl power trio group Mm. Then a jazz group called New Direction, then joined an R&B band called The People. She moved to Miami in 1972. She worked on her craft and paid her bills. Here we are in 1973, okay? She working on a cruise ship singing like a motherfucker, right? And she noticed this old Jamaican, you know, uh, singer over there. She wasn't impressed. He wasn't nothing special, okay, at first, right? But then something happened where... You know, anything can happen with us ladies. We think he owed Napoleon dynamite, dynamite at first, and then when we see him, like, punch a nigga in the face, all of a sudden now we start salivating off of Napoleon dynamite. You know what I'm saying? We're like, God damn, Napoleon dynamite shoes is fitting like, yeah. Moving on to uh, the pH factor, okay? Their first single was called Leaving the Good Life Behind, and that was produced by a dude named Larry Alexander. Now, in... Now, the band and Phyllis Hyman was feeling very confident, okay, about their, you know, capabilities. So they decided to get up and move to New York in 1975. We ready, New York! Is you ready for me? And they are now working at the popular restaurant called Russ Brown's, okay? By 1976, Phyllis Hyman is singing before music royalty. Uh-huh, because they heard about her. They want to know who the hell this bitch is on the stage with them big lips and them big-ass titties and that beautiful hair singing like this. She didn't so, realize how regal and beautiful and mesmerizing she was at the time. She didn't get that. 
child. Oh my God, them lips and them titties. That's why my titties are today. Okay, because the Phyllis Hyman, oh my God, she's so sumptuous. She's so scrumptious, y'all. Richard Clay was one of those who was entranced by Phyllis Hyman. The day before, he had just worked with Norman Connors. I know y'all know Norman Connors. Yes, you are my starship. Come take me out tonight. And when that motherfucker said, and don't you come too soon, I know what that meant then. Oh, but I do now. Anyway, the dude Richard Clay said, listen, I just got finished working with Norman Connors, okay? The next time I see him, I'm going to tell him about you. This was like, okay, nigga. Okay, because you know, people always selling wolf tickets. People always selling dreams. Norman Carnard is an amazing producer that has the awesome capability of recognizing talent and knowing how to put the talent with the music. Norman tells Phyllis, I'm going to come and get you. Okay? I got you. Phyllis, I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, nigga. That's what everybody say. One week later, Phyllis Hyman is in the studio singing, there's a spark of magic in your eyes. Oh, that was off. Candyland appears each time you smile. Oh, so Phyllis Hyman's career took off once Norman Connors released the uh, compilation. Because, you know, Norman Connors is kind of like a Quincy Jones. Okay, but anyway, the duet that she did with Michael Henderson called We Both Need Each Other was the thing that, uh, yeah, yeah, could you, uh, who is this? Is this Phyllis? Can you tell Phyllis I say come here? In 1977, Buddha Records signed her to a solo deal and released her solo album called Phyllis Hyman. Buddha was taken over by Arista Records, whose chief executive was Clive Davis. Clive, with him, if you don't do what he say do or move the way that he will, he will destroy you. You either going to dance with the devil in the moonlight or you're going to get the fuck out of here. Okay. So as soon as I seen this name, Clive Davis, I said, oh, no wonder. No wonder that lady had some issues. But anyway, in September 1978, Phyllis Hyman and her beau, Larry Alexander, married. Remember the Jamaican dude? that was on the cruise ship with her, you know, the one that produced uh, that first song, they got married, okay? She didn't marry that Jamaican man, okay? Also in 1978, Phyllis Hyman was a star on the rise who was working with Clive Davis, the man with the magic touch. Uh-huh, he got the magic touch as long as you do everything he say do, okay? Don't you know Clive Davis is like the Scientology? You either in or you all the way the fuck out. Okay, I'm just telling you, remember Narob told you? Remember Narob told you? You know, one of the people in the comments was like, why do you keep calling Clive the devil? Because that motherfucker is the devil. So this, so lady, the lady that asked me why I keep calling Clive the devil, hold on, here go your panties, right here. Okay, so anyway, the problem was that Clive wanted Phyllis to have crossover appeal like Whitney Houston. He didn't want Phyllis to just make black money. He wanted Phyllis to make all the money. So the All next the album was called Somewhere in My Lifetime. Remember that? Somewhere in my lifetime. Child bang. That was so off. But you know, I can't sing, but in my mind, I can. And I have to offer all my wholesome goodness to y'all. Uh, Somewhere in My Lifetime is the album she's working on now, right? She's working with Barry Manilow to produce the title track, right? Now, the album was released in 1979 and charted at number 12. Number 12? Clive Davis ain't happy. 12? We don't do 12s over here. We only do number ones. So you already know that Clive is looking at her like, girl, because he don't do 12s. He only do ones. So okay. for the next album, Clive Davis hired James M. Tume, you know, the song you, me, and he. What we gonna do, baby? Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's a bad bitch that can get away with that. Because you know it ain't too many dudes that's gonna share their pussy. Unless they don't care about the bitch. You know? But yeah, that James and Tumay. Ooh. Juicy. 
this juicy fruit. Oh, I like it. I like it. And this dude named George Lucas. They produced the song, You Know How to Love Me. Hey, hey. You know how to make it right. That song went to number 12. Uh, Clive, girl, what is you doing? We don't do number 12s over here. We only do number ones. Phyllis has a hit, but she's not out of the woods. Clive Davis is signing more female artists like Angela Bofield. The main song that I like from Angela Bofield is the song I Try. Uh, Vri Vri, Aretha Franklin, <laughs> and Dionne Warwick. Now, this is the big, right? I don't know how in the hell Clive, well, probably because he's a screaming queen, but I don't know how he dealt with all those women that required so much of his attention. And you know, they all say the same thing. They all say, uh, he over there busy working with her, so he ain't had time to work with me. Uh, when Whitney came around, he, uh, you know, forgot about She's me. He's not placing the blame nowhere, right? She just wants to sing her music, you know. She may not be number one, but she is doing fairly decent at number 12, right? But that Clive is putting the press on her. Girl, we don't do 12s over here. For the next album, she was paired with an old friend, Norman Connors, okay? She's cool with being with, you know, her old friend who hooked her up and put her in the forefront in the first place, but she's not happy with the label. Oh, like I, I said, because she's frustrated with the label, Phyllis Hyman is like, you know what? I'm not going to sit over there with the rest of them cackling bitches trying to, you know... Uh, get Clive Davis's attention. This is exactly how I would do it. Fuck that nigga, okay? My, I'm not chasing no nigga, especially not no queen, okay? I'm gonna go over here. And that's what she did. What Phyllis Hyman did was she started working uh, at a local jazz club. Okay. But she at the jazz club, right? And while she's there, a man who is working on a musical Broadway play, uh, what's the name of it? Sophisticated lady. She's there. The dude is there looking at her going, yeah, you be perfect for my new play. Sophisticated ladies. Phyllis say, oh, yeah? Yeah, baby. Yeah. Now, when she got back to, you know, the label, she talked to her daddy. Her label daddy. You know, or her label mammy. Clive Davis. Okay? Clive, you know I'm down there singing at the club. Clive said, yeah, I do, but I told your ass no. Well, I know you said no, but look. This dude wants me to do uh, the Broadway play Sophisticated Lady in the lead role. I want to do it. No, you don't. You need to stay your ass in this label and make me a number one. In 1981, Sophisticated Ladies opened on Broadway starring Phyllis Hyman, Gregory Hines, and um, Hinton Battle. She was nominated for Tony. Now, that right there... Definitely, I believe, made her happy because she's doing what she wants to do. Not what this queen over here is telling him what or telling her what she should do. She's doing what she wants to do. And I applaud that. That shows strength. Yes, we know that uh, Phyllis Hyman had some mental health issues, but it shows strength to do the opposite of what the people that are paying you, or at least... Some of the people that are paying you, because you're still getting that guap from sophisticated ladies. The but next album, Can We Fall In Love Again, at number 12. You know that goddamn Clive Davis is somewhere flicking the light on and off, okay? Or burning the skin off his hand. I got to get rid of this bitch. Being on stage and not evolving depressed her, and then she divorced her husband. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe that Jamaican? I don't know. The stage play ended in January 1983 and lasted 22 months. Ready for her newfound fame, what she believed was going to be her newfound fame, uh, she thought that she was going to be able to call the shots. And so, no. You know, the show was very, very successful for her, but she did another album and it did not do well at all. So, in Clive's eyes, all you do is 12. You number 12 around here. That's what I'm going to call you, Phyllis. 12. She no. released the album Goddess of Love. It did not do well, like I said. It's clear now that Clive is looking at her like, bitch, you've got to go. They both had different visions for what they wanted Phyllis Hyman to be. Phyllis knew what she wanted to be. Clive knew what he wanted her to be, okay? A moneymaker. 
She wanted to be happy. She wanted to uh, provide her craft to the universe and be happy. As a result, she reached out to two female managers who was named Glenda and Sylvia. Uh huh. I've seen them before. You know, I know one of them have like this thick, natural, blonde bush. I forget her name, but she seemed very, very close to um, Phyllis Hyman. Okay, because she was actually the one who made the calls for Phyllis Hyman when they found her. Now, Glenda, one of the managers, has said that Phyllis Hyman's business was all the way messed up. She was effed up before she even came to Glenda, okay? So she came through the door with business problems, okay? The first step was to hire a costume designer who would set her apart from the rest, okay? That woman came up with the hats, the plunging neckline, the big, beautiful lips. That was the woman who gave her her new look. Now, the next step for the managers was to try to mend the relationship with Phyllis Hyman and Clive Davis. Answer no. Answer no, uh, Gloria. Answer no with you. First of all, I hired you so I wouldn't have to worry about that nigga no more. And now you want me to go over there and apologize to him? Answer the no, girl. Now, at the time that Gloria... But well, the two new managers wanted Phyllis Hyman to make up with Clive Davis. It was 1984. And he just signed Whitney D. Houston. You know Clive, the devil Davis. His sentiment was, we don't need that bitch no more. I just signed Whitney D. Houston and Del Risa. Okay? Do you think we need the Phyllis Hyman? You think we need number 12 around here? No, you can take number 12. Y'all can do whatever y'all want with her. Bye, 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 bye. So after that, after Clive told her, you ain't shit but number 12. You can leave. Bye, bitch. Bye. Okay? Now, Phyllis Hyman is reluctant to continue in the business, but Philadelphia International Records changed her mind. In 1985, she signed to the label. And here comes, I can't stand this living all alone. Yes, baby. Oh, oh, oh I can't stand this living alone. Oh, <laughs> the song represented her life and love. Despite efforts, her love life was trash, just like a reefless. You know why? Because I believe that a lot of these singers are so deep. I think they have to be so deep in order to produce beauty. Okay, but they spend too much time worrying over dick. What the hell is going on with y'all worrying over dick? Because she had a lot of failed relationships along the way. Now, Gamble and Huff were worried about her weight gain and her weight losses and her mood swings. Now, the manager cites that she is now self-medication, medicating with pills and cocaine. In 1986, Phyllis Hyman went to Concord Rehab, and her Living Alone album went to number 12. Now, Phyllis Hyman is charming her audience but scaring her family. She's on and off of her medications because she hasn't found the right cocktail. If I can't tell you guys anything else, if your doctor, if you're, uh, let me take this back. If I can't tell you guys anything else, if you have some kind of mental health concern, and your doctor gives you a medication and you like, I don't like the way it makes me feel. Truly, okay? If you feel like I don't like the way it makes me feel, then go back to your doctor and get the right um, cocktail. You know, can you tweak this? Can you add that? Can you lessen this, uh, lessen this um, dosage? You know what I'm saying? There's no reason for you to live your life depressed, if you have some kind of uh, mental health concern. You know, like if I was diagnosed, and I told y'all I tried to do this shit before. I went to my doctor. I tried to tell my doctor that I was crazy. I was like, doctor, I am crazy. And I told y'all, my doctor told me, nay, get the out of here with this bullshit, girl. You are fine. I'm like, damn, this is not working. This is not working. They didn't believe me. They wasn't messing with me. Fuck, you can't even pretend like you crazy around here to get some time off. June 1990, Phyllis tried to uh, hurt herself with sleeping pills. Okay, you know what I'm saying, but it did not work. In 1991, she checked herself into a rehab in Florida. 
and then released her first album in five years, Don't Want to Change the World. You know that song. Don't want to change the world. I just want to be your girl. In 1993, her mother and grandmother passed and left her deeply shaken. In 1994, Phyllis went back to her theater roots but broke her foot in the process and ended up laid up for months. That's a problem because we already know that she's a pill popper. And if you break something, if you ain't got the wherewithal to be like, you know, what for Percocets, you know, just go ahead and give me an ibuprofen, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a concern. Anyway, okay. in 1994, she gained so much weight and continued to struggle with her demons. On June 30th, 1995, a week before her 46th birthday, Hyman committed, uh, I'm not even gonna say that, by uh, overdosing on a mixture of um, something called Tuinol and vodka in the bedroom of her New York City apartment. So anyway, what the unsung episode did not mention was the note that was left. It read, I'm tired, I'm tired. Those of you that I love know who you are. May God bless you. Now, the reason why I'm reading the note is again, because it was not mentioned in the unsung episode. And um, the, the term I'm tired is always a trigger word. When you hear the people that you love utilize the word, I'm tired, the words I'm tired. I need you to pay attention. And I'm not talking about, you know, when your baby be like, hey, baby, come on out here. Let's do ah, ah, ah. And you be like, no, child, I'm tired. Leave me the fuck alone. I'm not talking about that. I'm tired. You know what I'm tired is I'm talking about, okay? You know what I'm talking about. So please, guys, when your family is telling you I'm tired, when it comes down to work, when it comes down to love, when it comes down to life, anything, you know, addiction, I'm tired. That means they're ready to stop, okay? Now, if you have not already done so, please remember to like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to our success here on the YouTube. Now, remember this. The same people that we meet on the way up will always be the same people that we meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves, my love bugs, my bellas. You babies be safe out there. Peace.